Hello, uh, thank you for coming this morning and, and clock session. My name is Burton Levine. I'd like to thank my co-author who's moderating the session. We cannot be here now, Carl Crocky. I'd also like to thank the New York State Department of Health for funding this research, and Matthew Farley, who's the project director, who's in the audience. Today I'm going to talk about redirected inbound call sampling, which I'll refer to as RICS from now on. Uh, RICS is a non-probability non sample. It is low cost, and I was very surprised about the $16 per respondent for the uh, outbound telephone survey. So for what, at RTI, what we normally pay, pay for outbound telephone surveys, it's less than a tenth the cost. It's quick. For national surveys, you can collect thousands of respondents in a day, and there's low burden. The uh, respondents are all already on the phone. They, they essentially call you. What is Rex? Where does this data come from? Uh, RICS uh, participants come from misdialing toll-free numbers. Now, we could also collect data on toll numbers, but everything I'm going to present is from toll-free numbers. And they're different than the toll numbers that they're non-geographic. Um, it turns out that 9% of all the toll-free numbers uh, are redirected <coughs> and used by telemarketers to sell you things. So they'll sell you timeshares, vacation packages, insurance for car repairs, medic alert device, sex phones. Uh, it turns out that there's 5.4 million toll-free numbers are redirected. So the innovation isn't redirecting the numbers. The innovation here is applying the redirected numbers to collect survey data. So once you redirect the number, uh, you could collect, you have another number of options in how you collect data. So what the data I'm going to present to you today was all collected using interactive voice response system using uh, keypad entry. So if yes, press 1, if no, press 2, and so forth. Uh, we, it is also possible to collect data using voice. Um, Scott Richards is a company, Reconnect Research, who is a contractor who does this work. He uses Google Voice and it turns, tech, it turns voice into text. Uh, I'll talk very briefly on Monday. I'm very excited. I'm going to field, and we're going to. I'm going to try pilot the first uh, recruitment to the web. So this is a study in Florida, and we're going to uh, screen people for tobacco use and or young uh, 18 to 24 year olds, and ask if they are willing to receive a text message. If they say yes, we send them a text message with a a, a link to a web interview, and they get a $15 incentive. You could also send to a live interviewer, and yes, I, I haven't done that before, but we have plans to do that in the future. Today I'm going to talk about the National Adult Tobacco Survey, and I'm going to call that NATS from now on. So the NATS data have been collected, what I'm going to show you, three times uh, using RICS in 2016, 17, and 18, and we collected 1,000 plus respondents from New York State and 3,000 plus respondents from the rest of the country for 4,000 plus for each of the data collection periods. Concurrently, we use uh, we collect the same similar data for using RDD, a dual frame RDD with 1,500 plus in 2016 and 17. Now, the RICS in instrument is a subset of the dual frame RDD, which is collected through CADI. Uh, you, there's 35 questions in the uh, RICS instrument, and to add. To the mix, where I'm going to also show estimates from the 2016 National Household Interview Survey. This is kind of our gold standard for some health outcomes and from census data. Now, I know this graph is busy, and I'm going to summarize all this in one number in the next slide. But basically, let me walk you through a little bit of how to read the graphs. The, the yellow, the, the red bar are the census values. And uh, there's 95% confidence intervals on all the other bars. The, the blue bars from left to right, they're all red, 16, 17, 18. And they, uh, these are, it's not exactly unweighted. The only weight is the adjustment to account for the disproportionate uh, sampling within the <coughs> geographical strata. So the New York State rest of that. But other than that, it's non-weighted. 
the gray bars are the dual frame telephone survey, and these use the design weights. In addition, there's an adjustment for phone usage, cell phone only, landline only. So both of these are before they go to the calibration. To me, this is the apples to apples comparison. Now, there are two things I want to show in this graph. One is, I'm going to call it internal validity. What happens? We know that the census values don't change over time very much. So look at the blue bars and see how constant they are over time. That's a very good characteristic of a study. And, um, and the other thing is how close they match the population. Now, I want to thank Mansoor for doing something. I didn't know really how to say this, but I've, a lot of people say probabilities, non-probability samples are like this, or non-probability samples are like that. I take offense to that. You can't lump all non-probability samples together. And he used this word organic, suggesting that online panels are not organic. They don't look like the population. You have to do all these crazy adjustments. Well, in RICS, they do look like the population. They're not all non-probability samples are the same, and so you can you, you have to readjust your thinking. And so I told I told you I was going to put it all to one number. Well, this is a little technical. The unequal weighting effect is a measure of the variance of the weights, and it shows. Uh, so we, what we do is we take the unequal weighting effect of the design weights, we calibrate them. We calculate analysis weights, do the unequal weighting effect there, take the ratio, and so you see 1.25. That ratio is how much you have to stretch the weights in order it, for it to match the, the population totals. I then take the mean for the three years and the two years, and what do we see? So for the dual frame telephone survey, we've got to stretch the weights 24%. Whereas for the RICs, it's 31%. That's a 29% difference. Now, it is true that the dual frame telephone survey matches a little bit better, but it's not that much better. That's why I say it's organic. It has to do with the selection method, which I don't have time to really get into. So we'll look at some study outcomes. So now the red bar is the NHIS data, and again, I, I have 35 outcomes. I wish I could show you all 35 because I'm not cherry picking, but this really is representative of the 35 outcomes. <laughs> so you see the two things, how well we track in the RICs across uh, data collection years and how close it matches the NHIS. So it's pretty similar. I mean, some are higher, some are lower, but across the board, when you look at it, it's pretty similar uh, for the outbound telephone survey compared to the RICs. Um, so in 2016-17, we switched the instrument design so we don't have all of the data, and this we don't have NHIS data, but here are some healthcare outcomes. A lot of the survey asked about that, so I took three that were representative. You get the same thing. Those error bars are bigger because you have to have gone to a healthcare provider in 12 months and be a smoker, so the denominator is smaller. Uh, these are some smoking is questions, some opinion questions. <coughs> smoking is not allowed in the home, allowed in some places, allowed anywhere in the home, no rules. Notice the no rules, it's quite a bit different between the, the, the outbound and the, and the caddy. We know that there's some mode effects, and I don't know why that's different, but, but as a population health surveillance tool, <coughs> I'm going to suggest that one of the primary importance is to see changes over time. So you can see how policy changes affect opinion. And so even if they're different, we don't know which one's right, one, one, of, one very important characteristic is that they track over time. So I'm going to conclude that for many public health surveillance applications, RICS with IVR recruitment and IVR data collection is a useful tool. It's so much cheaper than an outbound telephone survey that you'll be able to do this where you wouldn't be able to afford an outbound telephone survey. And it's quick, and then it will able, enable you to get to rarer populations as well, which we know is very expensive. So I have a lot of irons in the fire. I'll just mention two. One, so we collected a data on 1,000 New Yorkers. We also have the New York Adult Tobacco Survey, which we could do all the same comparisons and more that I didn't show you. So we got a whole bunch of things to compare. Um, and I want to talk about the user experience survey. So last year, Sarah Depko presented at APOR about uh, Rick's where she moved to a live interviewer. And a lot of people were 
She reported that people were disappointed because they didn't know that they were um, redirected and some people were calling an emergency number, they were stranded on the road. Well, I, obviously that has to do with the consent language. So we're taking that to heart and we're developing an informed consent user experience study where we have five different versions of consent language. We give a dummy survey that looks like the BRFSS, and then we ask about the user experience. Uh, does the respondent understand they were directed? Are they in an emergency situation? Were they calling a business or personal? Where were they during the survey? How do they feel about completing the survey? So what, what we want to do is we want to see the relationship between the informed consent language and the throughput, the yield rate, which affects the cost, and the user experience so we make sure we don't have people who are, uh, that, that they're misunderstanding, that they're not talking to their original caller. Thank you very much.